Okay, so let's get started. So, uh, good. Okay, lots of machine. Thank you. Um, so, just to recap where we are. So, um, things good. Okay, so this is November 6th. Uh, we're a couple lectures ahead, remember. So, we're going to finish up thermal calc theory today and get into the praxis. Um, and then next week, we're going to actually start working on the walkthrough. And then we're going to have a two week break. We're going to have the week before Thanksgiving and Thanksgiving, and then we're going to come back and finish up the thermal calc project, and then we're done. So we're actually very close to the end of the course. Um, so we do have class this week, we have class next week, and then we're going to be on break for a couple of weeks. Okay, and then uh, do remember to all your stuff is due uh, November 13th with respect to the OOP2 stuff. Okay. So let's pick up where we uh, left off last time. So let's recast the one component stuff. So my claim was we can understand very easily one component phase equilibria. Um, using the thermodynamic framework we built up. Um, two component is a little more complicated, but if you can understand two component in this graphical manner I'm going to present, then you can understand n components. So let's just recap very briefly the one component stuff. And so we said if you have one component, Gibbs phaser will tell you you can have a maximum three different phases can coexist simultaneously. Of course, the system may have many more phases than that to pick from. It could be any one of all the, if you're looking at water, any of the ICs liquid water, um, vapor, but at maximum three can coexist. And then we said, okay, let's using our framework where we say the Gibbs free energy of the system is the sum over the Gibbs free energy of each of the phases. And if we can dive into each of the phases, we can sum over the components in that phase. And then we have a simplification because C is equal to one, that I is just equal to one. So we don't have to do the sum over components. And we can just express the Gibbs free energy of phase alpha just like this. So the chemical potential of our single component in phase alpha times the number of moles in that phase. So then we can sum over the phases to get the total Gibbs free energy of the system. Now our claim was that the system is going to behave like a rational consumer and it's going to try and minimize this Gibbs free energy. That's what thermodynamics tells us. And in the case of a single component, C is equal to one, we have a very simple prediction that the system is just going to pick the phase with the smallest value of the chemical potential because if it did anything else, it would be elevating its Gibbs free energy. So it's gonna live in the phase with the smallest value of mu alpha. If there's another phase, mu beta, mu gamma, which are higher than mu alpha, if the system were to partition partially into those phases, G is gonna go up and the system says, hey, this is, this is not good, I want to minimize my Gibbs free energy. So I'm gonna live in the single phase with the lowest Gibbs free energy. And so we saw that if there are a couple of phases with, which have the same, exactly the same mu. You can get coexistence, but that's the exception rather than the rule. And so we said, if you look over this phase diagram for this, uh, this particular system we're looking at, most of it is taken up by single phase regions, and only in very special cases do we see phase coexistence, so two phase and three phase. It's a very simple way of understanding phase equilibria. For a single component, what is the phase with the smallest chemical potential? Very easy. Okay, then we had a cool video of a triple point. Um, and then we said, okay, let's start worrying about two components. So this is all still recap. And so we said, let's worry about C is equal to two. So Gibbs phase rule says maximum number of phases that can coexist is four. And we can express the Gibbs free energy as the following. So the Gibbs free energy system, sum over the phases alpha, dive into each phase alpha, and worry about the two components that make up that phase. So I goes from one to two. And then we can take derivatives of both sides and take dg here and dn's here. So how much, if I change the number of moles of component one in phase alpha and the number of moles of component two in phase alpha, what is the effect on the Gibbs free energy? So we have the total Gibbs free energy and the effect of making changes to the number of moles of each component in each phase on the Gibbs free energy. And so these are the two equations we're gonna to use to minimize g and make our predictions for phase equilibria for two components. Okay, and so we said, let's, uh, let's get specific and just pick two phases and two components just to make our life easier. So we're gonna have two phases, alpha and beta, and we're gonna have two components, one and two. So let's just take the simplest possible non-trivial case. So the system has sort of three options. It can be pure phase alpha, pure phase beta, or a mixture of alpha and beta. And we would like to use some um, thermodynamics and some mathematics to make that prediction and ultimately build up to doing tau factor. Okay, so let's write down our equations. And so we said the total Gibbs free energy of the system, sum of the Gibbs free energy of phase alpha plus sum of uh, Gibbs free energy of phase beta. We can break each phase, alpha and beta, into its components, one and two. And we can take the differentials of both sides, just like we did on the previous slide. And then we have a couple of other conditions. 
So we don't want to make or lose matter. We're not doing any nuclear reactions here, so we can't be losing or gaining phase, um, components. So the total number of moles of component um, I has got to be the number of moles of component I in phase alpha plus the number of moles of I in uh, phase beta. And DNI has got to equal zero. And so we can't be making or losing um, any of our components. And so that means that if you add component I to phase alpha, you've got to be losing component I from phase beta in the same amount to maintain mass balance. Okay, so that all looks pretty good. And then the last thing we did last time was that we rearranged those equations into this, what looks like a sort of weird form, but it actually makes it really easy to analyze these things graphically. So I asked you last time to check that you can get this expression from the equations on the previous slide. It's very easy to do that. And the real benefit of this expression is that it expresses the Gibbs free energy of the system in terms of the per mole Gibbs free energy of phase alpha times the number of moles of phase alpha, plus the per mole Gibbs free energy of phase beta times the number of moles of phase beta. And so these things have a very clear interpretation of the per mole Gibbs free energy of that phase, and if we expand them out, there's this sort of weird thing in these square brackets. But we don't really worry too much about, about diving into the square brackets. If you can understand this is the per mole Gibbs free energy of the phase, then, then you're good. Um, if we divide through everywhere by n, n alpha over n is just f alpha, so it's the fraction of your system that lives in phase alpha, and this is the fraction of your system that lives in phase beta. So now we don't have to worry about total number of moles, we're just worrying about what, what fraction of the number of moles that I have in my system lives in each phase. Okay, so just uh, to, to sort of emphasize a few points here, the molar Gibbs free energy of phase um, phase C, let's just generalize, as a function of its mole fraction of component 2 is the following. So you can write down the per mole Gibbs free energy of phase C as a function of the mole fraction of, uh, of the second component in the following form. So that's just basically the square brackets that, that came up here. The mole fraction of phase C, F sub C, is N sub C over N. So that's the way that we went from this line to this line, to go from Ns to Fs, just by dividing through by N. And the final thing, which is super important, and the reason why phase equilibrium is hard, is that the chemical potential of component I in phase C is a function of composition. So as you change the composition of your phase, your chemical potential of the components in that phase are going to change. So you can imagine that you have this nice phase with some mixture of silicon and carbon. As you change the proportions of silicon and carbon, the chemical potentials of silicon and carbon in that phase are going to change. And that is going to change your values of G. It's going to change uh, G sub alpha and G sub beta. It's going to change the value of G for your total system. And so everything's changing as you're manipulating the phase uh, compositions. And so that's why phase equilibrium is difficult. Because these things are a function of composition. And we need to deal with that in order to make some predictions. OK, so that's where we left off last time. Is everyone OK with these equations, where they came from? They're satisfied. You can get them from the previous slide. And these three points all make sense. Good, OK. So we're going to get to graphical stuff very soon. And hopefully this will, all, this will all clarify very, very simply. OK, so if we were going to appeal back to our single component phase equilibria, we might think the following, which would be incorrect. That naively, you might think that if the per mole gives free energy of phase alpha is less than the per mole gives free energy of phase beta, the system would say, OK, I'm just going to live in phase alpha because I get a lower per mole gives free energy. Conversely, if the, if the gives, per mole gives free energy of phase alpha is greater than the per mole free energy of uh, phase beta, the system says, I'm going to live in phase beta. And if these two things are equal, you would be an alpha beta mixture. OK, so this is not true. So why is that not true? Because equality of the per mole Gibbs free energies of these phases is not the criterion for equilibrium. The criterion for equilibrium is equality of chemical potentials of each component between the phases. So these conditions are the equilibrium conditions, not this. So it's a sort of a subtle point the first time you see it. Uh, because you think naively, if you were to just extend from one component to two, this should hold. That's not true. These are the conditions we need to satisfy. So we remember that we said at equilibrium, you have to have equality of temperatures, equality of pressures. Those things are trivially satisfied because we impose uh, a uniform temperature and pressure on our system. And the third condition is equality of chemical potentials for each component between all the phases. So these conditions have got to be satisfied. 
Okay, so questions about that? Okay, so let's see how this lends itself very nicely to a graphical solution. So lots of equations, now let's, uh, let's look at some nice graphs. Okay, so imagine that I could plot the permal Gibbs free energy of phase alpha and phase beta as a function of composition. So composition in this case, big X, is the, is the composition of component two. And so we don't need to plot explicitly the composition of component one because these things have got to sum to unity. And so if you know what fraction of your phase is component two, you immediately know what fraction is component one. Okay. So these are actually the curves that live in the thermal calc databases or the, chem, chem, or the databases of any sort of CalFAD software. And so if you know these curves, you can actually make your CalFAD predictions. Okay, so just keep in the back of your mind, these curves exist in the databases and we can plot them. Okay, so we have these two things. We recall we're fixing P is equal to two, so number of phases is equal to two, so we just need to worry about phase A and phase B. So we've gone from alpha and beta to capital A and capital B. So sorry for the change in terminology, but it's the same thing. Um, okay, so we can plot these things, that's fine. So now how are we going to enforce our condition of equality of chemical potentials for each component <coughs> between the two phases. So I'll show you how we can do this in a very simple way. So the questions we're really trying to ask is for a system with overall composition x naught, so imagine your overall composition of your system is right here, we would like to answer the three following questions. What phases are present? Are we gonna have phase A and phase B, or just phase A or just phase B? What are the compositions of the two phases? So what is the mixture of component one and two in each of the phases? And what are the mole fractions of the system in each phase? If we can answer these three questions, we're done. We've made a phase equilibrium prediction for our system that we can, that we can then use for design or testing against experiments, etc. So let's answer each one of these questions in turn. Okay, so remember I said a couple of slides ago that the per mole gives free energy of phase C, where C can be A or B in this case, is equal to this square bracket. So the chemical potential of component one in phase C plus the difference in the chemical potentials of component one and two in phase C times the mole fraction of component two. So this is just a square back bracket expression from a couple of slides ago. So now we're gonna analyze this, and if you stare hard enough at this, you see that the right-hand side is just an equation of a straight line, so something very easy, where our x-coordinate is this big x here, and we can define the intercept, as we will see in one second. And the left-hand side defines the tangency condition for this um, right-hand side the equation of the straight line. Namely, that when x is a particular value, it's going to be tangent to this curve. So what does that really mean? So let's look at this graphically. So let's pick a particular value. So x sub a, we're just going to pick that arbitrarily. And we're going to pull that up to our GA curve, so our parmo gives free energy of, of uh, phase A. Okay, then we can draw our tangent line. So why does that have to be a tangent line? Because the right-hand side and the left-hand side have to agree at this value of x A that we've chosen arbitrarily here in blue. And then we can plot out the right-hand side as a straight line. So if we plot that as a straight line, we can then analyze the intercepts. So on the very left-hand side of the plot, where x is equal to zero, this is precisely mu one alpha. So the chemical potential of component one in phase alpha. Because when x is equal to zero, this term disappears, and we're left with this. Conversely, on the right-hand side of the plot, where x is equal to one, mu one alpha, mu one alpha here, annihilate one another, and we're just left with mu two alpha, the chemical potential of component two in phase alpha. So if we draw the line all the way to the right-hand side, we get this intercept, which is mu two of, uh, of phase A, phase alpha. You can play the same trick with phase uh, B. You can draw the tangent line, and you will see that if you do that, on the right-hand intercept here, you get the chemical potential of component two in phase B, and on the left-hand side, you get the chemical potential of component one in phase B. So just by graphical solution procedures, we're able to draw some tangent lines, and they tell us the chemical potential of each component in each phase, just by looking at the intercepts. So no equations here, just drawing some lines on a graph, and we get the chemical potentials by the intercepts of these, of these lines with, with the walls. So with x equals zero and x equals one. Okay, so why on earth would we want to do this? Because at equilibrium, the chemical potential of component one is going to be the same between the two phases, and the chemical potential of component two is going to be the same between the two phases. 
So what does that mean graphically? It means that these tangent lines have got to be coincident. So let's go back one slide. I just drew x sub a, the composition of phase a, and x b, the composition of phase b, sort of arbitrarily, and drew some tangent lines. But we can change the positions of x a and x b until our tangent lines are coincident. So that's what I've shown you in the next slide right here. I've adjusted x a and x b such that these tangent lines are completely coincident. So what does that now mean? It means that the chemical potential of component one in phase A is identical to the chemical potential of component one in phase B, because these intercepts are exactly the same point. Similarly, on this wall, the chemical potential of component two in phase A and component two in phase B are absolutely equal, because the tangent line intercept um, happens at the same point. So at equilibrium, this has to be true. This condition, condition is satisfied if and only if the two tangent lines have coincident intercepts. And this tells us that we can enforce this condition through a common tangent construction. So this is known as the common tangent construction. You just adjust x a and x b, the overall composition of the two phases, until your tangent lines are coincident. And then you're done. So then you know that you've enforced equality of temperature by fiat, pressure by fiat, and chemical potential at these particular compositions of the phases. So is that clear? It's a way of enforcing equality of chemical potentials for each component in this very simple graphical manner. So we'll get some practice of that in just a second. So what's the bottom line? So phase A with composition XA, so this very special composition of uh, XA of phase A, and this very special composition XB of phase B allows these two phases to coexist. Only at these particular compositions can these phases coexist, because only at these particular compositions do you get equality of chemical potentials for the two components. Okay. So is everyone okay with this? Do you want me to go over it one more time? Is anyone feeling lost? Okay. So let, let's keep going. So what is the Gibbs free energy of this two-phase system? So we recall our previous expression, the per mole Gibbs free energy of the total system is the per mole Gibbs free energy of uh, phase A. So that was just this line that we drew here, this nice parabola, times the fraction of the system that lives, the mole fraction of the system that lives in phase A, plus the per mole Gibbs free energy of phase B, this nice parabola over here, times the mole fraction of the system that lives in, in uh, phase B. So, Clearly we can get this, ter this uh, quantity, G A bar and G B bar, just by looking at the plot, because we know exactly where we're living. We know from the common tangent construction, X A and X B, and then we can just read off the value of G A and G B. What we now need are F A and F B, so how are we gonna get F A and F B? Um, okay, so does anyone want to give me a suggestion for how you might get these things? From a rule that we looked at last time. It's not going to be the Gibbs phase rule, it's going to be the other one. Lever rule. Okay, so these guys come from the lever rule. So imagine our system has overall composition x naught. We can draw that right there. We know from our common tangent construction the composition of uh, phase A and phase B, so the DMO fraction of component 2 that lives in phase A and phase B. And so just by the lever rule, we can figure out our FA and our FB. And so if we're interested in the fraction that lives in phase A, we can just take xb minus x0, so this lever arm divided by the total. If we're interested in the uh, fraction of system that lives in phase B, we just take this lever arm over the total. So that gives us our x. Plug into this expression, you've got the Gibbs free energy for the system. Um, okay, so what is interesting about this? So we see that what the system can actually do is it can lower its free energy, its overall free energy, by moving along this green line to get a lower overall Gibbs free energy compared to if it existed purely as phase A or purely as phase B. So if it was purely phase A, it has to live on this parabola. If it's purely phase B, it has to live on this parabola. If it allows itself to mix, it can actually live on this green line. So the Gibbs free energy is given if you plug it plug these into this expression, you will see the Gibbs free energy is exactly this green line right here. 
And so the system, like a rational consumer, says, if my composition lives between xA and xB, I am better off splitting into two phases and being partially A and partially B rather than remaining pure A or pure B. So this is exactly what, what happens from, from thermodynamics predicts. You minimize your Gibbs free energy. The system does exactly that. Um, OK. So what happens outside this region? So outside this region, if you try to apply the lever rule, so if you try to apply the lever rule here or the lever rule here, you will find that one of FA and FB goes negative. So meaning that you have an unphysical result, meaning the system is not two phase. So the system, if it has a total composition here, it has to live in pure GA. Why? Because B is much, much higher in free energy. As it moves into this region, it can lower its free energy with respect to either pure phase by demixing and being a two phase system. And as it moves out the back end here, it has to be pure phase B. Why? Because the chemical potential, the uh, free energy per mole of phase A is much, much higher. So as we move left to right, pure A, pure A, pure A, pure A, pure A, A, B mixture, A, B mixture, A, B mixture, A, B mixture, pure B, pure B, pure B. So just by plotting these curves, which come from thermodynamic databases, drawing a few tangent lines, we've actually been able to predict the phase of the system and its uh, mole fractions in A and B just by doing some very elementary algebra. Draw some straight lines, apply a lever rule, and you're done. OK, so let's reinforce that. So we basically solved the problem using graphical te techniques, meaning we can predict the equilibrium system state as a function of composition. So x naught less than x a, meaning the composition of the system, um, it's not sufficiently enriched in component 2 to enter this two-phase region. It's to the left of this common tangent construction linking these two parabola, and so it's pure A. So pure A with composition x naught. So that's what's happening in this region of the diagram here. If your system composition is between the xA and the xB that we found from the common tangent construction, it turns out that you can minimize your Gibbs free energy of the system by demixing in two phases with compositions xA and xB, and with fractions of those phases defined by the letter rule. If x0 is greater than xb, you're pure phase b with composition x0. So that's just what we said in words last time, just reinforced again on this slide. OK, so is everybody pretty comfortable with this idea? So it's just minimization of Gibbs free energy using graphs. So one thing that's important to remember, that the common tangent construction defines a tangency condition between these parabolae. So Unless these parabolae have their minima at exactly the same point, xA and xB do not occur at the minimum, the local minimum of the parabolae. So it's kind of difficult to see here, so let me try and draw that. So if you have two parabolae that are exactly at the same height, you draw a common tangent, and this common tangent does occur at the local minimum of each of the parabola. However, if they're at different heights, you draw a common tangent construction. And so the intercepts of the common tangent with the parabola do not occur at the minimum. So just it looks like it in a lot of these diagrams, but that's not true. So just be aware. It's not where the minima exists that defines xA and xB. It's this common tangency construction that defines xA and xB. OK, so just something that people can frequently get confused with. OK, so let's see this in action. So this looks good. I believe you. I seem to be able to predict what the minimum um, Gibbs free energy is going to be and whether that's going to be pure A, pure B, or a mixture of A and B. But how do I turn this into a phase diagram? So everything that we've seen before, to go back one slide, is plotting the <coughs> permal Gibbs free energy of the system as a function of composition. So that's not typically what we're interested in as material scientists and engineers or chemical engineers. What we're usually interested in is actually a phase diagram. So we would like to see what are the phases of the system present at a particular temperature and composition or at a particular pressure and composition. And so how can we get that from analyzing our Gibbs free energy plots? OK, so we adopt the following procedure. We construct Gibbs free energy diagrams, like we sh showed in the previous slide over the range of temperature or pressure of interest. 
identify the equilibrium states using the procedure we just described over the entire composition range and progressively build up our Tx or Px phase diagram. So it's almost like doing tomography or something. You take a particular temperature, you analyze it over a complete range of composition. You take a different temperature, you analyze the phase behavior over the complete range of composition. So layer by layer by layer, you can build up your phase diagram. So for example, imagine the phase diagram we would like to construct is temperature composition. So we pick a temperature, we pick temperature A. We do this Gibbs analysis for that temperature to analyze the phase behavior along this entire cross section of our diagram. We'll then pick a new temperature, temperature B. We'll do the Gibbs analysis to analyze the phase behavior over this cross section. We'll pick a new temperature, temperature C. We'll do the analysis along this cross section. And layer by layer by layer, we can build up our phase diagram. So this is exactly what's happening under the hood of any CalFAD software. And so let's see that for three particular instances. So let's pick a temperature A. So very left-hand pane here. So this is the high temperature point. So we analyze our databases. We ask CalFAD to plot the permo Gibbs free energy of phase A phase B, so it gives us these two parabolae right here, and then we analyze it in exactly the manner we described. Okay, so let's try and draw a common tangent construction. Turns out you can. And so why? Because phase A is always lower in Gibbs, thermal Gibbs free energy than phase B. So in other words, phase B is always metastable with respect to phase A over the entire composition range. So if you were to try and draw sort of common tangency construction between these things, you would find that the Gibbs free energy is only ever increased if the system partitions into phase B. It's always going to remain in phase A, because that's globally the lowest and best thing it can do. So moving left to right from 0 to 1, we see we're phase A, phase A, phase A, phase A, phase A, phase A, phase A. And so let's plot that in our diagram in black. OK, so that's sort of an uninteresting case, but it also illuminates a further point that your system could potentially be any number of phases. There are a sort of infinity of different phases your system could be, but most of them are really high in Gibbs free energy, so you only need to really worry about, in your calculations, the low Gibbs free energy phases. So you can save some time in computation by doing that. OK, so let's see what happens if you go to a lower temperature. So we go to a lower temperature, temperature B. The system responds in the following way. We replot the curves for the permal Gibbs free energy of phase A and phase B. It turns out at this lower temperature, Gibbs free energy of phase B has become reduced with respect to phase A, and they actually intersect at this very special point here. And so you'll see why I picked this very special temperature in a second, because as we go left to right, we're going phase A, phase A, phase A, phase A, phase A. There's this one point where you can almost think about this as collapse of the tangent condition. It's a very special point. You do your common tangent construction, and the curves actually lie right on top of one another where the two parabolae intersect. So this very special single point, your phase A and B by the common tangent construction. And then as you move to the right, you go back to being phase A, phase A, phase A, because phase B is higher against free energy. So let's plot that. Black, 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 phase A. This very special single point, your A and B. So let's color that white. Then you go back to being phase A again. OK, so let's look at one final temperature, temperature C. Replot the parabolae for A and B. And in this case, we can do our common tangent construction we saw on the last slide. So we move along in phase A here until we hit this point where the common tangent construction tells us the system can lower its overall Gibbs free energy by splitting into phase A and phase B. So this green line is lower than either of the black parabolae. At this point here, we see we can no longer make the common tangent construction, so we have to be phase B. And then on the right, we can remake the common tangent construction, split into two phases. And then as we move to very high enrichment in component two, we're back to being phase A once again. So just when you can construct the common tangent, the system is going to split into two phases. When you can't, it's going to be the phase that's lower in the thermal Gibbs free energy. So what does that look like? So moving left to this point right here, we're going to be all pure phase A. Let's color that black. Between this point here and this point here, we're going to be two phase A and B. In this skinny region here, we're going to be pure B. So we're plotting that right there. Back to being two phase A and B over here. And then in the very right, we're going to be phase A again. So by plotting these Gibbs curves at different temperatures, analyzing the behavior, and plotting these section by section buildup of the phase diagram, we can construct these phase diagrams that we're very used to seeing in, in textbooks and in, in journal papers. 
So you may not worry too much about where these things came from before, but this is one way, computationally, of constructing them. And so, of course, we don't have to go through this laborious graphical procedure. It's all done numerically by the CalFAD software. But in principle, this is really what's happening. OK, is everyone OK with this? Are there any questions? Yes, so you can, so first of all, these Gibbs curves are super idealized in this right. case. They're not always going to look like very nice parabolae. And so if you have some very sort of complex Gibbs behavior, you, things like that can happen. That's right, absolutely. So for example, this is also one very special point. And so when the parabolae just touch, there's only this single infinitesimally small composition window where you get two-phase behavior. Um, so if that were to persist to lower temperatures, you might get this sort of behavior you described. Okay, so let's look at another example where we have three phases. So two components, three phases. Does the same thing work? Absolutely it does. And so let's imagine that we have three of these Gibbs parabolae. How would we analyze this to make a three-phase, two-component phase diagram? So we're interested in making this Tx plot. So we're going to take some temperature sections and do our Gibbs analysis of temperature A, B, and C. So what do those curves look like? So let's look at the low temperature first. Let's plot our Gibbs curves. We have phase A, phase B, and phase C. Let's plot our common tangents everywhere that that's possible. So the common tangent between A and B is this green line. Common tangent between A and C is this yellow line. And com uh, common tangent between C and B is this other yellow line right here. OK, so let's move left to right. So we have our Gibbs curves. We have our common tangents. The system is going to minimize its Gibbs free energy at every stage. So on the left here, what's the best it can do? It has to be pure A. There's no other place it can go. So it's going to follow this red curve down here. As soon as you break this composition here, it has some choices. It can be pure A, or it can be AB. It can be on this black line segment, or it can be green. It's going to be green, because the green is lower than the black. It's got the lower Gibbs free energy. It moves down here. As soon as it hits this composition, it now has three options. It can be AB, it can be AC, or it can be pure A or pure C. And so what's it going to pick? It's going to be the lowest one. It's going to stick on this green line here. So we're moving down on this green line, and then we move past this point here, and we go back up, and the only thing it can be is pure B. So our system is going to be A, A, B, and B. So at all points, C is metastable to A, B, and the A, B mixture. So C does not even feature. The system is never going to partition into phase C. So how do we visualize that in our phase diagram? On the left, we're A. In the middle, we're A, B. On the right, we're B. OK, so what about this other temperature? Temperature B. We're building up another section. So let's build this. Let's draw our three parabolae. Let's draw our common tangents. This is a very special point where the two yellow common tangents are actually coincident with the green common tangent. We have one master tangent that connects all three of our parabolae. So a very special case. So as we move left to right, we're going to be pure A. That's the best the system can do. As we move through this point here, we're actually going to have three phase equilibria between A, B, and C because they all lie on this common tangent. And as we move out to the right here, we're going to be pure B once again. Um, so as we move through here, we're A, we're A, 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 then we're A, C, A, C, A, C, then we're um, C, B, C, B, C, B. And at this very special point in the middle, we could be all three at once. And so as we plot this on the curve, we're pure A, A, C, C, B, B. And so we get this strange sort of very complicated behavior along this red line. Okay, let's finally look at the high temperature C. So not to belabor the point too much, we redraw our three parabolae, draw our common tangents, and we see the best the system can do here is pure A. Here it likes to lie on the A, C common tangent. Here it has to be pure C. And then here it's on the C, B common tangent. And then moving out to the right, it's going to be pure B. So we just draw that in the following manner. So this looks a lot like phase diagrams you may have seen. It's sort of the collapse where you get the eutectic point right here. And so you get the two phase at the top, you get the two phase at the bottom, they can collide. And you can get a very complicated behavior, but actually when you pick it apart, it comes through very simply just by analysis of Gibbs free energies. Okay, so that was predicting phase diagrams. So at any point, you could give me a temperature, any composition, and I could tell you, okay, you're going to be C and B. 
then you might ask, well, how much of C and how much of V? So it's a nice logical question to ask. And you can get that just from the lever rule. So you could pick a particular point on your composition space um, and temperature, and you can just use, apply the lever rule to get your fractions of A, B, and C as a function of composition. So that's a very easy thing to do. So how would one do that? Going back one slide, you would figure out where you lie at a particular temperature, and you're currently in the two phase BC region, for example. This is your overall system uh, composition. This is your um, equilibrium composition of C, equilibrium composition of B. Just apply the lever rule over this region to get your F, C, and F, B. So you can do that repeatedly at different compositions and build plots like this. So for example, you are tracing from zero to one in component two, and you can plot the phase fractions just by repeat, repeated application of the lever rule on your phase diagram to get the fraction of the system in A, fraction of B, fraction in C. So in this particular case, C is uh, metastable at all compositions, so we're always zero for FC. And we can see that as you move left to right, so starting here at a particular temperature, we're moving to the right through pure A, so FA is equal to one. In this region, you start to trade off between A and B, and by the time you move out to the right, you're pure B. So not only can you get what phases exist, you can also get in what proportion do these phases exist, another very important design variable we'd like to study. Okay, so I'm not gonna go over this, but this is taking it one step further, where C is equal to two, so two components, but now four phases. So you just draw your four parabolae, and then you apply exactly the same um, logic in order to build up your phase diagrams. So I recommend you just spend a few minutes um, after class today just checking you can understand this for C is equal to two, P is equal to four. It's exactly analogous to what we did before. Draw your parabolae, draw your common tangents, and then ask where you can get your minimum gives free energy at every point. Build up the phase diagram section by section at different temperatures. So, okay, just before we move on, one other point, what if you're interested in a PX phase diagram? You would just repeat this procedure for a particular temperature at different pressures. So it would just be like doing tomography, but now in pressure. You pick a particular temperature and pressure, you build your G-curve, do your common tangent business, you pick a new pressure, you build your G-curve, you do your common tangent business, and so you just build up your phase diagram in PX instead of TX. So very simple, exactly the same procedure. Okay, does anyone have any questions on this? So lots of horrible math that took us to this point, but by the time we sort of massaged our equations for the Gibbs free energy into this very nice form, we're able to do everything just purely graphically. So if you understand this idea of drawing parabolas, drawing common tangents, and then just picking the lowest Gibbs free energy at every point, you don't actually need to know any of the thermodynamics. We're just drawing lines on, on a graph. Okay, so I promised you that if you understood this, we could go to the very general case of any number of components and any number of phases using exactly the same thing. So the procedure is completely analogous. It just occurs in a higher dimensional space. So because we have, say, three components, we can't represent our x-axis just in a single variable, which is the mole fraction of component two. We actually need mole fraction of component two and mole fraction of component one. The balance is component three. And of course, that extends to higher and higher dimensions. And as you get more and more phases, you're going to get more and more of these um, Gibbs free energy surfaces, and we need to worry about constructing common tangents between them. So the principles are identical. Humans have difficulty visualizing n-dimensional spaces, and so we're going to solve the thing numerically rather than graphically. So you can understand that underneath it all, in principle, an n-dimensional graphical solution exists, but of course we're going to do things numerically rather than graphically, and we're going to get CalFAD software to do it for us. So for example, Perhaps if you are a three-component system, so you now need a plane in order to specify your composition, and then you have a bunch of different phases, so P is equal to, to P, so big P is equal to little P, so some arbitrary number of phases, you can, in principle, construct common tangents just in plus one dimension. So you draw your parabolae, which now actually become surfaces, so these green, orange, and purple things are the permal Gibbs free energy surfaces, or these three different phases, BCC, FCC, and sigma phase. And then in order to figure out your equilibrium conditions, you just draw tangent planes. So instead of tangent lines, we're in a higher dimensional space, we draw tangent planes, figure out all the intersections, 
and then at every point in this plane, in this XCR, XNI plane, we figure out what's the lowest Gibbs free energy the system can get, what phases exist, we apply the lever rule to define their compositions, and we do exactly the same trick. We just have one more dimension. So we typically do this using software rather than drawing lines on a piece of paper. So from that, you can generate these terrifying diagrams we saw last time, these ternary phase diagrams, very simply. It's just an exactly analogous procedure. Okay, so CalFAD is gonna do it all for us. In principle, a graphical solution exists, but it's gonna happen numerically. So that's what I'm trying to convey with this. Okay, so what are the applications of this? So why should you do CalFAD? Well, you might want to get a job. So you might want to work for Ford Motor Company or NASA or SpaceX or some company like this who are worried about designing new materials, high performance materials for sort of extreme environments. Um, and so in order to make your life easier, you may want to pre-screen materials using computation rather than evaluating every single one in the laboratory under very experimentally um, sort of laborious and expensive conditions. So perhaps you can do some pre-screening using CalFAD and say, you know, this material's not gonna work, it's gonna liquefy at too low a temperature, this one's gonna have too much of this phase in it, which I know can make my structure brittle, so I'm not gonna worry about studying this one. This composition looks pretty good. Let's have a look at this one in the laboratory. So high throughput pre-screening, sort of very materials genome, uh, computer-aided design type ideas. Um, okay, yep, high throughput design, another thing. Predictions. So perhaps you want to extrapolate to extreme conditions, you know how your material behaves in sort of laboratory conditions, but you're worried about can it uh, withstand certain pressures in the depths of the ocean? What's gonna happen to my material? Is it gonna undergo some terrible phase change and the whole thing is gonna collapse? Or is it probably gonna be okay? And then to do research. So maybe you're in a research group who are worried about developing new materials, and so perhaps you can do some of the work on a computer rather than actually doing everything in a laboratory. Um, so making predictions before you actually go to study. So what packages can you use? So there are a number of them. So as I said, I think most, if not all of these are commercial, and so you have to pay for them typically. Um, so just providing you a list here of some you might be interested in, um, some that may exist in your lab group or in your company. The one we're gonna use is Thermal Cal. And so like I said, we purchased the teaching license, which costs several thousand dollars because it is a commercial thing. Uh, it's installed on these workstations. There is like a restricted license with a restricted term available for academics. So if you're a student um, or a faculty member, et cetera, at university, you can go to the ThermoCalc website, um, just give them your, your name and your email address, and they'll send you a download to install for a certain period of time. I think it's like three months or six months, and doesn't have all the databases, but it gives you something you can play with on your, on your local machine. Uh, so if you're interested in doing something um, at home, you can certainly do that. We do have it installed here, but it's not accessible outside of this room, essentially. It's sort of an IP-locked version, so you can't get at it by SIA, um, SSH. You have to be sitting in front of these computers for it, for it to work, unfortunately. Um, okay, so it's not an open source software, and so the, there, there's more sort of difficulties in, in using it. Good, okay, so that's the theory of phase equilibria. So, so let's just recap what we said. We need to build up thermodynamics to minimize our Gibbs free energy. So we appeal to the fundamentals of thermodynamics, um, computing the Gibbs free energy by summing over components and summing over, over phases. If we can do that, it turns out we can set up our equations in this manner that's amenable to graphical solution. And so it turns out in two component systems, you can enforce the equality of chemical potentials by drawing a common tangent. And by doing that, you can basically solve your entire system on a piece of paper, knowing the Gibbs curves. For higher uh, numbers of components for three and higher, things get very complicated. In principle, a graphical solution exists, but instead of drawing tangent lines, you have to start drawing tangent planes or tangent hyperplanes. And so we let the computer do the work for us using optimization software, basically, to do that graphical solution in a numerical way. Um, and how do we do all this? We do it through packages such as these. The one we're gonna look at is Calpad. Okay, so let's, uh, let's take a break there for two or three minutes, uh, grab some water, and when we come back, we'll look at actually the implementation of CalFAD, so using ThermoCalc to do all this horrible theoretical analysis we just discussed. Okay, so see you in a few minutes. <laughs> Okay, so let's, uh, let's talk about the, uh, the practice of, uh, of CalFAD. In particular, the practice of CalFAD in ThermoCalc software. <coughs> so what is ThermoCalc? 
So ThermoCalc can make you described. I think this is just taken straight from their website. It's a powerful software package used to perform thermodynamic and phase diagram calculations for multi-component systems of practical importance. So this is their logo. This is their website right up here. And so you can compute things like stable and stable phase equilibria um, using precisely the procedure we just described. Of course, it's all automated. The amounts of the phases using lever rule, uh, potentially in multiple dimensions. Um, thermochemical data, such as enthalpies, heat capacities, activities, um, things like um, solidification simulations. Um, some of these we will not use. Basically, we'll restrict ourselves to calculating phase equilibria, amounts of phases present. But there are more advanced um, uh, functionalities available if those things are of interest to you. So take a look at their website. If you're interested in sort of materials design on a computer, going beyond perhaps just the elementary CalFAD will describe if that's going to be useful to you in your research or, or internship, etc. Okay, so there are console and GUI versions available. We're going to use the GUI version. The, uh, the sort of console terminal ver version is actually sort of quite painful to use, and so we're going to stick with the GUI, but the terminal does exist if, if you want to play with that. It's supported uh, because it's a commercial enterprise on all software platforms, the Windows, Mac, Linux. Um, licensees can run a few thousands. Uh, we're lucky we've managed to secure a teaching license, so that's great. And there's also this demo version you can install on, on your personal machine at home. Although, do be aware that the version that's accessible here in the EWS labs is going to be different from the one that you install at home, uh, meaning you may not have the same thermodynamic databases. There may be restricted functionality because it is sort of a test version. So you may not be able to do all the things you need for the walkthrough and the project using the demo version. Though I will guarantee you'll be able to do all the things you need using the version, teaching version that's installed here. So just do be aware of that. Um, it's widely used in industry and academia, and there's plenty of support reference material available through their, through their website. So just a brief history of the code. It sort of started in 1997 in uh, Stockholm, Sweden. So this is sort of the, the timeline here. Um, the goal was to develop software tools for computational thermodynamics, so that had been an ongoing research enterprise at the, uh, the uh, KTH in Stockholm. And so it sort of spun off um, as an independent commercial company. And so I think in 1981, the first version of ThermoCalc came out. And so it is really a mature technology. It's a mature software package. Um, most of the bugs have been worked out, and, and it works very well. So the user manual is available here. So I think the walkthrough that I give you is going to be detailed enough. You shouldn't have to worry too much about the user manual. Um, but it is available here for, for your reference if you find something is not behaving as you expect, or you want to look at going a little bit beyond what I've said in the walkthrough. Uh, very nice, um, very accessible manual is, is available for free download. There's also a CalFAD test group. So if you're really excited about CalFAD, that's the thing you, you want to work on in your in your graduate studies, or if you want to go into industry and work on CalFAD, uh, very good textbook available, um, Computational Thermodynamics, the CalFAD method. So I believe I checked it is available in the library if you want to look at it. So not required for anything we're going to do in class, but going beyond if, if you're interested in CalFAD, great place to start. Um, there are also training sessions for thermal calc. So if you're really excited about thermal calc and you want to become a thermal calc guru, you can go to one of these training sessions. So this is from, I think, the 2013 one that was in Pittsburgh. So they're offered every year. So if you can convince your advisor to pay for you to fly somewhere and take a, take a training course, these are available. Um, and they will really allow you to access all the sort of advanced features of thermal calc and get some good practice in, in understanding um, how to run the software at a much higher level than, than what we're sort of going to do. OK, so start circling back around to the very beginning of this section. We said that CalFAD really consists of two things. It consists of thermodynamic databases and the CalFAD formalism. So the way you can break this down is basically into the G curves and then a way to solve numerically the graphical procedure we just went through in the, in the last few minutes. So thermocalc blends these two things. It ports these databases and it analyzes them using optimization tools, basically, to, to do the CalFAD method. So this is a slide you've seen before. We take the thermodynamic databases. These are sort of very expensive things to make. And so the academic version of ThermoCalc does not come with all of the databases available. You have to pay for them. So the teaching version that we have has slightly more. And if you pay for the research version, which is even more expensive, you get all the databases for ThermoCalc. The CalFAD methodology is actually pretty simple. It's sort of standard optimization tools. Um, we, we don't know exactly what happens under the hood of ThermoCalc. It's not an open source software. But it's almost certainly at the level of sort of the optimization toolbox in MATLAB. So it's nothing too fancy. And using that, you can plot all the diagrams we just described, and even more. 
Um, okay, so I, I sort of like this paragraph that I just pulled from their from their website. And so basically, you can pull from those two important things: the prediction of properties of multi-component systems. That can be a difficult thing to do um, in the laboratory because your your search space is so large. If you have more than say two or three components, being able to test all the possible combinations of your components is very sort of laborious. So doing that on a computer in a predictive way is, is, is sort of uh, very useful. And you can also improve understanding of various industrial and technological processes. So you know you have a good material, but perhaps you'd like to understand why is it a good material? What is it about the phase behavior of this material, its response to temperature, pressure, composition changes, that make it a good material? And using that knowledge, you may be, may be able to then bootstrap even better materials. So you understand why this one's good, and using that you might say, well, what if we do this? Maybe we can make it even better. And so you can use thermocalc as actually an under, a tool for understanding and also for design. So perhaps you can do some iterative design, see what happens when you perturb the properties, and circle round and round and round until you've designed a very good material for your purposes on the computer. And using that, you may then go into the lab and actually test it for real. So what can thermocalc do? So like I said, we're not going to look at all of its functionality, but here are some of the things it can do. So calculating, obviously, phase equilibria, amount of phases, uh, transformation temperatures. You can also do fancier things, um, like predicting a certain solidification. You can do thermochemical analyses. You can actually do chemical reactions. Um, and you can do ele um, electrochemistry also. And so really all of these things boil down to two things, design and optimization of uh, materials and processes. So let's just look at a few examples. So uh, perhaps the simplest thing one could do is look at a unary phase diagram. So C is equal to 1, one component. What are the phases that exist at particular pressures and temperatures? So you could do this for water and check that thermocalc works by plotting the phase diagram for water. I've done it for iron here. And so like we said, in a unary system, the system is going to pick the phase with the lowest chemical potential. Sometimes you will see chemical potential is exactly equal, in which case you will see uh, binary equilibria. And sometimes you may see ternary equilibria, but we're never going to see quaternary or, or quinternary, I guess, um, equilibria because that's banned by the Gibbs phase rule. Um, OK, so you can plot this, and you can show at high temperatures you're going to be liquid. As you cool down, you're going to first go through FCC. Um, and then depending on the pressure, you can either go to BCC or HCP. So depending on your applications, you may be interested in manipulating your system to be one of these crystal structures. Um, one important thing we've sort of glossed over, that everything we're doing in CalFAD is at equilibrium. And so it's T equals infinity. And so we're not worrying about any kinetic effects. And so for example, you might take some liquid iron up at sort of 35 pascals um, and 2700 Kelvin, cool it down, it's going to nicely turn into FCC, and then you're going to quench very quickly, say, to 300 Kelvin. And so at equilibrium, you would predict it would be HCP, but in fact, for a long time, it might still be FCC, like on the order of months or years or perhaps even millennia, because it's kinetically trapped in the FCC um, crystal formation. And so just do bear in mind that as you're doing all of these calculations, they are equilibrium calculations. And so if your system does not have the energy to jump over the barriers necessary to change into its lowest equilibrium phase, or if it's a too low of a temperature, you may not actually ever be able to attain equilibria on laboratory timescales. So just do take these things with a grain of salt. So one way around this, and we will see this in the walkthrough, is that we can remove particular phases from the calculation. We say, OK, the time scale for iron to turn from FCC to HCP is on the time scale of years. And so actually, I'm not even going to consider HCP in my calculation. So that's one way of sort of cheating. Um, but just do bear in mind, equilibrium calculations, you might not see agreement with the experiment for kinetic reasons. OK, so an important point. Um, binary phase diagrams. So just like we went through all, all the graphical calculation procedure, you can compute these graphical phase diagrams, or, um, these, uh, these phase diagrams in the blink of an eye using thermal calc. Just load in your components, load in your database, um, press go, and it'll produce these diagrams very, very quickly. But we do realize under the hood what it's doing is it's taking temperature sections and building these up incrementally using those Gibbs plots and the CalFAD method of common tangents. Um, so you can get temperature mole fraction. Um, you can sort of get temperature mass fraction if that's what you prefer. You can also get mole fraction versus activity if you're interested in the activities of your component. So you can plot them in lots of different ways. Um, and thermocalc makes that very easy just by changing the menu buttons. Ternary phase diagram, so now it's not common tangents. It's, uh, it's, it's not common tangent lines. It's common tangent planes, since this will be solved numerically. 
So you can plot things such as this. So this is a ternary phase diagram for the FECR NI. Um, and I guess we're plot plotting the liquidus point as a function of temperature. You could also get this to plot the phase diagram. So this is what is going to be the composition um, of the different phases present at different um, compositions of your system. And you can also get it to do the lever rule to predict what fraction of your system is going to be in each one of those phases. So those things all happen very easily within the thermal calculus. Um, okay, you can actually also get it to plot the Gibbs surfaces. So this plot I showed you in the, in the last uh, slide deck actually came from thermal calc. And so you can ask it to directly plot the Gibbs surfaces. Um, so this is for BCC, FCC, and sigma phases um, of the iron, chromium, nickel phase diagram at P is equal to 700 Kelvin. And so if you're interested in those Gibbs surfaces, you can actually plot them out. And perhaps that's interesting because you want to show that a particular phase is always metastable. And so you don't ever actually need to consider it over the range of temperature pressure composition that you're interested in because this Gibbs surface is way higher than all the other guys and so it's never going to feature in any of the phases you're, you're going to see at those conditions. Um, if you're an electrochemist, you may be interested in sort of Courbet diagrams, which are aqueous electrochemical phase diagrams. So you can plot things like the, um, you make a pH versus the, the, um, the voltage curve and you can see how things behave with respect to sort of corrosion, passivation, you can do all these things. If you're sort of worried about designing, say, coatings for materials in sort of dangerous environments, and you don't want them to corrode um, as soon as they become immersed in water, etc. Um, so you, you can do these things within thermal cal. We won't actually do them, but they're very easy to do. Uh, you can also do property prediction. And so rather than just plotting sort of phase equilibrium, plotting phase diagrams, you can plot properties. And so maybe you're interested in estimating the heat capacity uh, of your particular system. In this case, it's gold silicon as a function of temperature. And so it can give you heat capacity data, which could be interesting for, for design purposes. OK, so let's dig in a little bit to the thermodynamic database. So we're going to analyze sort of the first part here. And so the, these G curves that we've been talking about so much, which really allow you to do all the CalFed stuff. So in order to make accurate predictions of phase behavior, you need accurate, validated, consistent thermodynamic models. Um, and so what does that mean? It means they've got to be accurate, meaning they give good answers. They've got to be validated, meaning they've been checked against experiment where possible. And they've got to be consistent, meaning that two databases don't conflict. And so if you analyze something in a ternary database, it shouldn't conflict as soon with the binary database as soon as one of your components goes to zero. So you need to be self-consistent. And so typically these are built, and I think we discussed this a little bit back at the beginning of, the, of this module, that your databases come from three sources, fundamental theory, empirical rules, and experimental data. You can use them to build your G uh, curves. You can do parameter optimization and finally get your, your terminal databases that allow you to do all the CalFAD stuff. And then you close the feedback loop by actually making CalFAD predictions and checking those agree with experiment and theory. So it really is a sort of iterative, self-consistent procedure. And building these databases is a big deal. It's an expensive and uh, sort of laborious thing to do. So thermal calc possesses a lot of databases. Um, so some of them are sort of more common for ap our applications than others, but some of them can be quite specialized depending on what your particular interests are. And so the standard ones are sort of, you know, steels and, um, and iron alloys. You can do nickel-based super alloys. Uh, but you can also get fancy. So you can do things like um, noble metal alloys, if that's what you're interested in, or geochemical environmental databases that allow you to do sort of mineral analysis that you might find in the crust of the earth. Or if you're a sort of nuclear engineer, maybe you're worried about nuclear materials and nuclear fuel waste processing. So you can download or buy the thermocalc nuclear um, database that allows you to understand things like you know, uranium cores, plutonium cores, and do sort of phase modeling for, for those guys. So we're going to sort of stick to the common stuff. We're going to look at sort of um, iron, nickel, aluminum, silicon, these things. But databases for really exotic situations do exist. So this sounds really simple. All we really need are sort of the thermal Gibbs free energies for all the possible phases of interest. Yes, that's true. If you can draw those Gibbs curves, those Gibbs surfaces, you can do everything. So that gives you all the, all the possible information you could need. The thing is, the models are actually really complicated. So a lot of times when you plot one, it will look like a nice parabola. But actually, under the hood, there's a lot of data that's gone into generating that curve. Um, so you get horrible sort of multi-polynomial models that look sort of messy like this. We'll never actually go and look at these things, but if you pull them out under the hood, these are the sort of functions that we're dealing with. So they're not just simple quadratics. So a thermodynamic database 
really means a collection of polynomials describing the Gibbs energy of the individual phases as a function of temperature, pressure, and composition. If you have those, you have everything. You can apply the CalFAD methodology and get all the predictions you could ever care to make. So how do we build these? So we can't just sort of just draw them arbitrarily. So we do appeal to some sort of theoretical basis plus some parameter tuning in order to fit these models. So what we're after is the Gibbs free energy. So we're after the Gibbs free energy curve. And so we try and build this up in sort of a sensible way. And so how might we do that? So the basic set, um, basic reference state could just be the elements. So you're worried about a particular um, Gibbs surface. So the first thing you do is take the, the elemental uh, Gibbs free energy. You then might need to worry about mixing. So you have your Gibbs free energy for silicon and for carbon, but now you're worried about for, for the mixture. And so you might want to do some configurational ideal mixing, which is sort of the idealized situation of mixing. It's purely entropic. We're not worried about interactions between the atoms. And then you add on to that this thing called the excess contribution, which, uh, which sort of encompasses all the non-idealities. Um, so really, this stuff is trivial. The elemental reference state and the ideal entropic mixing is sort of very easy. It's sort of super basic thermodynamics. We'll get into that in one second. All the action happens here. So the non-ideality is really everything. And if you have a good function here, you'll be able to make good predictions. If you have a bad function here, your predictions are going to be terrible. And then on top of that, less commonly, you may want to add some sort of physical constraints. So maybe your system is under strain or in a magnetic field or under flow, and you may need to modulate your Gibbs free energy based on any external conditions. Um, okay, so let's just look at sort of the first non-trivial case, which is a two component, so binary solution. And so the reference term just looks like this. And so the Gibbs free energy for my binary solution is um, Gibbs free energy of A times mole fraction of A plus the Gibbs free energy of B times mole fraction of B. So that's sort of the reference thing. It's the simplest thing you could do. So you then say, okay, there's also going to be some ideal entropic mixing, so let's just add on um, the mixing term. This comes from just elementary thermodynamics for mixing on a lattice. Um, so if you've studied things like polymer chemistry, where you have the Flory-Huggins equation, or the Hildebrand equation, this is the mixing term that exists in those equations. So it's just really talking about how many different ways can the atoms arrange themselves without worrying about interactions between the atoms. So there's entropic mixing. So these two things are very easy. They sort of come for free. So your Gibbs curve might look like this. So you have your reference line. So that's just a linear combination of the Gibbs free energy of A and B, the elemental reference states. Then you add on top of that the ideal mixing term. You get something that looks sort of like a parabola right here. And then you need to worry about making your ideal sort of approximation look a lot like the, real, the reality. So what happens actually in an experiment. So the difference between these two guys is the excess term. So this also explains sort of why most of these curves look like parabolae, because they all contain this term right here. And this looks typically like a parabola. So if you just have elemental reference state plus ideal mixing, you get something that looks like a parabola. And then we fix up all the non-ideality by adding the excess term on top. OK, so everyone OK so far? Just how we're building up our Gibbs functions. So then the excess terms, this is where all the action happens. And so over the years, over the last more than a century, there have been a number of different models proposed to sort of capture non-idealities. So basically this reduces to picking a functional form, which is sensible and sort of has been shown to work. Um, so this is one, the redlich kister expansion, which just has sort of a polynomial expansion in the difference between the mole fractions of A and B raised to some power. So it turns out this is pretty flexible and also works pretty well. And then it's just parameter fitting. So then you just have to fit the coefficients of the expansion in order to reproduce either fundamental theory or experimental data, and then you're done. So these things typically look horrible. And so these are sort of the expansion coefficients as a function of composition. And so these are, this is the zero first and second expansion coefficient. And when you add them all together, this is sort of the Gibbs um, that comes out of that. And so we just take this, we fit them to experimental data or fit them to um, theory, and then we have our excess contribution, and finally we have our, our full um, Gibbs prediction. So going higher, three components, it's exactly the same thing. You have your elemental reference, you have your ideal mixing contribution, you have your excess term, and then you have any sort of fields on top of that. So elemental reference state, Ideal mixing now for a ternary system, 
Then your access is where all the action happens. This is what you're paying for when you're buying one of these databases. You have the binary mixing terms, and you have the ternary mixing terms, and you can go higher and higher for C getting bigger and bigger. So the protocol is the same. It's really just the parameter fitting and making sure these agree with experimental data and are self-consistent. It's where, where all, all the sort of difficulty and expense in making these databases happen. So I've said this a few times now. You must maintain consistency. The ternary model that you construct must reduce the binary model as one of the component fractions goes to zero, or else you're going to have an inconsistency in your database and your predictions are going to be unreliable. So it's absolutely vital, and it's a painful thing to do. And so there's a lot of validation that goes into making sure this consistency occurs. OK, and then higher order solution phases with more and more components and more and more phases is, is simple. It's exactly analogous. When you start to have solid phases, there are some special considerations, worrying about sort of solid liquid, solid gas equilibria, sort of crystal structures, etc. And so if you're interested in worrying about how these Gibbs functions change when you go from sort of the liquid phase to the solid phase, um, I would advise you to take a look in this very nice textbook we looked at before, and then we'll explain how you have to modify your Gibbs functions when you have solids moving around. So of course, these are all encoded in the ThermoCalc database. These will all happen automatically without us even knowing about it. But if you're interested in the theory, um, take a look at the theory. OK, so CalFET. So we talk about the databases. And then it just becomes doing the procedure we described numerically in high dimensions, depending on how many components you have. So minimizing the Gibbs free energy under given conditions. So really, we just have to take our Gibbs function, sum over all the components, all of the phases, and then we want to minimize that to make sure that we have our lowest possible Gibbs free energy, and that's going to be our prediction for the equilibrium state of the system. And so we have to set dg by the change in the mole fraction component i in phase phi has got to be zero, because you need to be a global minimum. You need to also make sure you're a global and not a local minimum, so you need to do some sort of fancy optimization. And when these conditions are satisfied, g is minimized, it's stable because all of these things are, are, are zero, then you're done. So then you've made your prediction. And so basically, it's just optimization tools. So what does ThermoCalc do? We don't exactly know, because it's commercial software, so we don't know exactly what the optimization tools it's using. Um, but we can look at the literature, and we can see w w what's in the, in the public domain. So there's a couple of papers here, if you're interested in actually how you implement these optimization procedures to minimize the, the Gibbs free energy of your system. Um, so this one here, Gibbs energy minimization method for constrained and partial equilibria. Calculation of constrained equilibrium that gives energy minimization. All the tools that, that are sort of described in these papers are probably what's happening in thermal calc, and all of them are available in MATLAB. So it's, it's not a terribly onerous thing to do. Doing it sort of efficiently maybe requires some effort, but, but the, the principles of the optimization, the minimization, are, are not difficult. So if you're interested in the sort of the numerical implementation aspects, take a look at these, these papers here as a good starting point. Um, OK, so any questions on either databases or CalFAD methodology? So all it basically boils down to is getting the Gibbs free energies from the databases and then minimizing them using some optimization algorithm to predict what, what the lowest Gibbs free energy state of the system is going to be. Once we've got that, we have everything. We've made our thermodynamic CalFAD prediction. OK, so how do, we, how do we run this? So that's what we're going to do next week. So running thermal calc. So like always, sort of I think the right way to think about running code is like a recipe. And so that typically makes things very easy. And so like I said, running code is actually easier than understanding code. And so the reason we went through all the theoretical understanding is so you know what's happening and what to do when things go wrong. But basically, running it is very simple. So sort of I like to think about it in sort of seven steps. You pick a database. So you say, I'm worried about um, sort of steels. So I'm going to use the steels database. Very good. Pick the elements in your system. You're going to pick iron, carbon, and then a few other things, maybe chromium, magnesium, something like this. Choose all the possible phases in the system. So maybe you know for a fact that if you left a piece of steel um, for millennia, it would eventually turn into graphite. You're not interested in that equilibrium calculation because you're worried about things on the time scale of years. So you say, I'm not going to allow graphite to be one of the phases in my calculation because I'm worried about a certain time scale of years, not millennia. So you may have to use some of your material science intuition in order to do this. So you go to the, data, the phase database and say, eliminate graphite. Um, 
So I think in actually the project we will do this. So you will run a steels calculation with and without graphite. And when you have graphite in, you will get this crazy phase diagram that looks like nothing you've ever seen in a textbook. You'll take graphite out and you'll get the textbook phase diagram. The reason being graphite really is the stable phase on the time scale of millennia. Humans are not interested in that. Okay, define the conditions. So you need to define the conditions with respect to Gibbs phase rule. And so we need to make sure we have exactly zero degrees of freedom or else our calculation is underspecified. If you have less than zero degrees of freedom, your calculation is overspecified and actually impossible. So you need to respect the Gibbs phase rule. So thermal calc sort of does that for you. It will complain if you over or underspecify your system. It won't let you progress to the next step unless you've properly specified and you have exactly zero degrees of freedom. Um, so what, what does that really mean? It just means you have to write down f is equal to 2 plus c minus p, and you need to make sure you specify things correctly. So the number of intensive variables that you specify have got to respect Gibbs phase rule. Okay. You then calculate the results. So you then, thermal calc sort of turns away. The things that we we're doing, we're going to be doing, will sort of execute the time scale of a few minutes. More complex calculations you may want to do with thermal calc could require hours. Um, stuff will be, will be quick. You then analyze the results by defining the space you want to you want to understand and visualize, and then you plot and tabulate them. And this all happens in a nice GUI pipeline directly within the thermal. So as you're running your walkthrough next week, um, it might be useful to sort of look back at this. So the walkthrough is sort of very detailed. It goes into all the minutiae. You know, click this button here, press this button here, change this parameter here. But it might be useful to have a sort of more uh, broad overview. So as you're running through the walkthrough, you can identify when in this hierarchy you are as you move down through it. So maybe that's useful as, you, as you're doing the walkthrough next week. Um, okay, so any questions on, on any of this stuff? Yeah? I just had one quick question. So if you're, if you're working on a system that absorbs water or something like that, you would, I guess, I'm just wondering if I get it right, you would add hydrogen, oxygen as elements, and then erase everything else except for maybe the water phase and the choosing phases in the system. Yeah, if that's what you're interested in, that's right. So, so that may be a terrible thing to do because it could be that the hydrogen and the oxygen actually interact with the components of the, of the cement and actually make different phases. But you can constrain it any way you like. You can say, you know what, I'm not interested in any hydrogen-oxygen compounds except water. And if you have good reason for suspecting that, you can calculate that phase behavior. That's right. So there does need to be a good amount of human intuition when you're setting up the problem. Um, so things like time scales, like we discussed, or possible or impossible phases. Um, so you do need to have some care. It's it's the old adage that we, we talked about at the beginning, it's gigo. So garbage in, garbage out. If you set your problem up wrong, you're going to get terrible answers. So you need to understand what you want to calculate, what you're interested in, before you actually do the calculation. Yeah, it's a good plan. OK, so let's watch. No, I don't think we have time to do this. So we have a short thermal calc video. So, well, let me do the following. So let me play the video. Um, the link is here. So if you want to leave, please just go ahead and leave. Um, or you, the video lasts about four minutes. So if you want to just hang out, we can watch the video together. Um, so I'll play it right now. But otherwise, that's the end of the praxis. So we've talked about the theory. We've talked about the praxis. Next week, we're actually going to get into the walkthrough and actually do some calculations using thermal calc. And this video is a nice setup for it. So I'll play it right now. If you don't want to stick around, you, you can leave and watch it at home. But it really goes through sort of all the, the elementary steps and setting up a thermal cal calculation. OK, so that's really it for today. So let me start the video up. Um, but otherwise, I will see you on Tuesday um, where we'll actually start doing some thermal cal calculations. So Swedish, right? How the software looks the first time you saw it. The application is divided into several different panels. Oops. This video tutorial explains the application layout and key concepts for using a new version of Thermocal. This is how the software looks the first time you saw it. The application is divided into several different panels where most of you order interaction with six facing figures. The first one is the project plane. This is where you create and change relationships in activities. 
more about this later. The center plane for example, this is where you select sediment, the temperature, pressure, composition, diagram axis, and so on. The rightmost plane is where results in the form of tables and plots are shown. Before doing anything else, let's focus for a while on the concept of activity. In Thermocast 3, we are always working with a project represented by the project node in the project field. Below that, we will create a sequence or map of activity. There are different types of activities for different things. For example, there is one for defining your alloy system, one for setting up calculation, and one for plotting results. Activities can be created in different ways. Now I will manually create one at a time and explain what I'm doing. There are other ways to do it that will allow easier setup of most types of calculations. I will set up a calculation of the iron carbon phase diagram and talk you through the whole procedure. By right clicking the project and activity node, the context sensitive menu appears that shows what can be performed on that activity. Now I right click the project node and select Create New Activity System Defined. A new node appears in the project pane that is used for setting up the system. It's automatically selected, and you can see that the center pane was replaced with a periodic table. This is the configuration for the system definer. This is where you, for example, open a specific database, select elements, open a material file, and select or deselect faces. Let's select iron and carbon in the periodic table. For this example, that is all we have to do in the system definer. Now I right click the system definer node in the project page and create another activity, an equilibrium calculator. Now an equilibrium calculator node is created, and it has an arrow pointing to it from the system definer. This can be thought of as the result of the system definer going into the, the equilibrium calculator, which can use that system for its calculation. The type of calculation that will be performed depends on how the equilibrium calculator's axes are configured. To calculate the phase diagram, we need two calculation axes and for the common binary phase diagram, one should be composition, the other is temperature. Depending on your default values, you might have to enable one or two, just like I do here. We also want to plot the phase diagram. So in a similar way as I did to create the first two activities, I create a plot. Just as before, the new activity appears in the project thing. But because this activity also produces output to the screen, it is assigned a tab in the new results pane. Now the plot is empty because the plot has not yet been performed. Performing activities is another important concept. So far, I have only configured the activity. None of them has been performed yet. Performing an activity means that the activity operates on the configuration and produces a result. That result is used as input for the following activity which operates on its own configuration and produces another output. For example, in our current project, the plot activity takes the resulting phase diagram calculation and plots it using the configured diagram axis. So let's perform the plot. Right click the plot node and click Report Now. Now something happened in the window we haven't looked at yet, the scheduler. When the plot is performed, the project the program recognizes that in the current project, none of the activities above the plot have been performed. Since the plot meets the phase diagram calculation, which in turn meets the system, all three activities are scheduled and performed in sequence. Also, when I perform the plot, a new window appears, the event plot. Here you find information about ongoing calculations, warnings, and error messages. It will show automatically when you click perform and disappear when the calculations are done or when you click somewhere in the application outside the event plot. When the calculations are done, you will see the plot in the result tab. Okay, so it's easy, easy as that. So, like always, you feel really mad at me for presenting all the theory, but really you just click a few buttons and you're done. Yes. Okay, so it's a very easy, easy user-friendly program. Great, so everyone have a good weekend. Um, see you on Tuesday.
Um, and if you have any questions or queries about your project topic, please please send that to me via email, or, or we can we can arrange to speak during office hours. Okay, thanks everyone.